Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, friends and colleagues from across the world. We are back in the United States today uh, with uh, a, a superstar and a, and a leader of industry, Dr. Joshua Austin. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Austin. Thank you so much for having me. It's a huge honor. I really appreciate it. Yes, we are very honored to have you, and I'd like to make an introduction uh, about you to the to the audience. Uh, many of us know Dr. Austin from his uh, his uh, uh, editorial as being the editorial director of the famous Dental Economics magazine. He also hosts uh, the Working Interferences podcast, which I enjoy personally listening to. Out of all the podcasts I have, I have had the pleasure of, of listening to, Dr. Austin is very unique. Um, he, he creates a, a medium between, takes a unique approach between humor and reality to create information for our colleagues. Sometimes just dropping information on people doesn't make it, a, 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 is not enough for people to listen and absorb and engage. And I really highly recommend you guys to tune into the working interferences and just listen to some of the some of the episodes you will be very well very entertained and today another unique thing that dr austin is doing for us out of all of the 100 plus uh, uh, presentations that we will have by the end of the summit this one is about the mental connection it's about situations and positions we might find ourselves in in life that where we could take different approaches to make things better for us in the future. And he will uh, give you uh, the ideas about his mo motto, his what he lives by, which is transparency and authenticity. Um, and now the official bio of Dr. Austin. Dr. Joshua Austin maintains a full-time restorative dentistry practice in San Antonio, Texas. He's an editorial director and columnist for the dental economics, focusing on dental products and technology. Dr. Austin lectures around the country to study clubs and dental meetings about these topics, along with online reputation management and social media. Dr. Austin is a graduate of the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio Dental School and spent five years post-graduation as faculty in the Department of Restorative Dentistry. Nice. His approach to his pearls for your practice column is a fresh approach in today's commercially driven dental journalism. When you read the pearl, Rest assured that you're getting an honest evaluation of a product which was used by Dr. Austin in clinical practice on a patient. Um, so yeah, your reputation uh, uh, precedes yourself. Uh, many people I've spoken to really love you, think very highly of you, and they think that you are there to counter a lot of nonsense that goes on in dentistry and you do a very good job at it and you don't hold back. You're 98% usually right. Uh, you're all 90% usually right, but uh, you have taken this up on yourself uh, uh, to help others, and we're really appreciative of that, Dr. Austin. Well, thank you so much for having me. Like I said earlier, it's a huge honor, and to see the list of people, I'm a huge fan of Miguel Stanley, who you had on yesterday, um, so to come like the day after him is like, wow, that's crazy. He's he's one of the world's best, and, and just like many of the other people on, on, your, on your 100 list here. So uh, we're going to get this going. Um, this is really the first time that I've done this presentation in this format. Um, so I appreciate you guys uh, voyaging on this journey with me. But we'll talk about the mental dental connection. This is my dad. Uh, my dad's a dentist and, and I showed this picture of my dad uh, before every uh, program that I do uh, for a couple different reasons. Is I'm proud of my dad and I'm proud of what he's done for dentistry over the years. He, he taught at the dental school here in San Antonio for many years. Um, and uh, before he taught at the dental school here, uh, he was in private practice in Amarillo, Texas. And uh, I have some photos of his office. Uh, and I think about kind of the dentistry that I do today and it being adhesive dentistry, um, you know, digital dentistry, those kind of things that, that we do uh, in, in, you know, 2020 uh, decade dentistry. Um, and then I think back to the dentistry that my dad did, which was almost completely non-adhesive, amalgam, you know, cast gold and lays on lays, crowns, uh, partials, dentures, no implants, nothing digital, um, and just how much the world has changed in really a short amount of time. Um, this is the outside of my dad's dental office. He practiced in Amarillo, Texas, uh, and they opened this dental practice in 1972. Uh, and they started with a five doctor group practice 
uh, which nowadays a five doctor group practice is not that big of a deal. We see them everywhere, every city, every town, you know, has, has probably has a group practice that has at least five docs in it. Uh, but in 1972, this was revolutionary. You're talking about a, a time and place where this was strictly, you know, a solo practitioner game. And here they came, you know, teaming up and, and built this really nice building. And and uh, the building still stands in Amarillo, uh, Texas, which is up in the panhandle of Texas, if you're unfamiliar. And um, the, the building is no longer a dental office. It's now a TV studio for the Clear Channel Communications News uh, uh, studio for Amarillo, Texas. Um, but it does still stand and, and this sign still exists just with a, a, a different uh, wording on it. Um, here's the waiting room of, of the office. And, you know, we look at this now, uh, especially with, with uh, uh, the COVID-19 stuff happening and all the changes we've made to our offices and we've all eliminated the waiting rooms. Uh, and I look at this picture of this very large waiting room uh, and just think about how different things have changed, even from like, you know, two months ago uh, to us not even really having waiting rooms anymore you know, back here to, to 1972. You notice at the front desk where uh, where the two receptionists are, are chit-chatting on company time, uh, no computers anywhere, all paper books everywhere, um, you know, just a different, different time and place. Here's another view of that same waiting room. Uh, this picture was taken ostensibly in another zip code because this waiting room is so large. Uh, I, I look at this office and think about all the, the, the wasted space and, and how much all this costs and I'm just, you know, I, I feel the back of my neck start itching with the idea of what the overhead of this office must have been. Uh, this next photo is one of my favorites of this whole series. This is my dad's office manager, Georgia. Uh, and when you look at this picture, I, I at least, and I don't know about you guys, I can't help but be reminded of one famous celebrity, uh, the one, the only Dolly Parton. For some reason, Georgia just reminds me of Dolly, that sassy Southern woman that you would find, you know, in the South, in Texas, in the 70s. Uh, it's just the epitome of Dolly Parton to me. And I can literally hear Georgia's voice in my head as I look at this picture uh, and, and hear all the quirky Southern sayings that she said. I do love the woman in the white bell-bottom slacks in, in the background there, um, who's, uh, I guess, holding up one of those file cabinets. Uh, listen, lady, you got time to lean, you got time to clean. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if we're here taking photos, you can at least pretend like you're working. Uh, the other thing I love is is really back, if you look directly behind George's back, you will find uh, what was the height of dental technology uh, in the 1970s, and that was that intercom system. I mean, that was the... Uh, that was the Sirac Prime Scan and Prime Mill of 1972. That was as cool and, and high tech as it got in a dental office. You know, my dad would walk through my office today and, and ask me, you know, uh, do you not have any patients? Because I don't have huge banks of filing cabinets everywhere. You know, just everything has changed in a dental office. If you look behind Georgia, uh, you will see there is, uh, there's her dentrix right there. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but right there is, is her dentrix. And, uh, you know, again, you would write a patient's name and pen if they were trustworthy and pencil if they weren't, right? And uh, again, just everything has changed. Here's the other office manager, Debbie. Uh, and, and, and Debbie, say what you will about Georgia being stuck in 1958 with her beehive haircut. Uh, Debbie uh, is revolutionary. This picture was taken in 1972 and Debbie is ready for the eighties. She is ready for white snake to pour some sugar on her as she rides around on the hood of a Camaro, right? She's got the cut off sleeves. She really is ready for 1984 hair metal. Um, you know, she's just a decade too soon. Here is a, here's a, a, a candid shot of my dad uh, doing, um, what I like to do in the laboratory, and that's hold up the countertop. I'm somewhat allergic to lab work, so I'm I'm glad to see that that's genetic, uh, and that uh, and that he liked to do the same thing. Uh, here's something that I don't have in my office, and that most of us probably don't have in our office, uh, and that is a library. Why don't we have to have a library in our office today? Well, because we have these. We have iPhones with Google. And so if you need to Google, you know, an RPD design for a Kennedy class two, you can Google that and get the information you need. Back in 1972, that wasn't available. And so you would have to literally have a room with all your books, 
textbooks, journals, whatnot. And if you look that right in the uh, on the right hand side of the screen, looks like a computer monitor. I can assure you it's not a computer. That is microfiche. Microfiche. So that was again another kind of super high tech thing that, that they had in their office. And certainly they would have meetings in here and stuff like that. But the idea of having a room devoted to your textbooks, you know, basically be a library for your office, um, that to me is 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 breathtaking. Here is another one of my favorite photos of this series. This is the break room at my dad's office. And um, I just love the patterned wallpaper with the mirror in the middle and the and the almost identical pattern on the chairs, but just a little bit smaller because there's nothing like giving your employees the illusion that they're in a circus fun house when they're on their break. Uh, and we can guess what kind of break they were on here by if you look at that little end table right in the middle, what do we see there? Seems crazy today, but look at that ashtray. She's got a pack of Virginia Slims with her lighter on it. Hey, just middle of the day, it's 10.30 a.m., time for my smoke break, which just seems crazy to me today to, to allow your employees to smoke inside your office. But it was a different time. What can we say? This is the radiology room. And again, just another amazing wallpaper here. I just love seeing these, these wallpapers. And at the time this office was built, it was really high design, you know, the, 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 the classiest of the classy. And looking back on it, of course, it looks cartoonish and ridiculous, um, but uh, it, it is fun to look back. Um, you know, I, again, I don't have an x-ray head on a wall in my office. Uh, we use nomads and 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 granted, I do have a pano, but my pano doesn't look anything like this. My pano doesn't have a lap bar. What what is this? A roller coaster? I don't understand. Does the chair move while the tube head stays stationary? What is happening with this old pano? Uh, these are just things that look so ancient and old, and it wasn't that long ago. Here's one of the operatories, uh, which I love. Um, I love this delivery system in chocolate brown. There couldn't be anything more 70s than that. I love the red carpet. Best thing about red carpet is when you extract a tooth and you drop it on the on the floor, you know, you don't have to worry about any blood stain or anything. You just kick it off to the side. No big deal. Uh, that delivery system comes in red. In case you're looking at building a new office, you have those options. Um, so, so don't feel like... Uh, like, like you don't have any, any color options. I'm sure it also came in avocado green, uh, but we can't put avocado green furniture on red carpet. This place is classy. We have to make wise decisions here with our interior design. And this is really my favorite picture of the entire series. This is my dad. Um, and, and I just wish I knew what someone told him before this photo was taken. The only thing I can imagine is someone, uh, is he was asking the person who took this photo, is who picked red carpet because I can't look at that hallway without thinking of this. Uh, and if you don't know what this is, uh, this is a gif from the movie, The Shining. Uh, and, and this hallway, it, I just can't look at a hallway, a long hallway with red carpet and not think about The Shining. Um, now I don't know about you guys uh, and I don't know why you guys became a dentist, but for me, it was my dad. Uh, and I know that many other dentists become a dentist because one of their parents was a dentist. It's a common pathway of entry into our profession. Uh, and sometimes my patients ask me, kind of apropos of nothing, just as an aside, if my dad was a dentist, which I honestly kind of find of in, I, I kind of find insulting uh, in, in a little way because in my head, I automatically translate that to uh, why on earth would you want to do this for a living if you weren't pressured into it by a helicopter parent? Uh, and I certainly wasn't pressured into this by a helicopter parent, um, but my dad is the reason that I became a dentist, no doubt about it. Um, today, it's clear to me why I chose that path, and it's because I wanted his approval. I became a dentist because I wanted to make my father happy. And I think that's something that probably everyone wants to hear from their parents, that they're happy, that they're proud of you, that they're glad you're their child. Um, I think we're hardwired to seek out that kind of approval, especially from our parents, the most important people in our lives for, for a good majority of our life. Um, there's one problem with making that the reason that I chose my profession. 
I'm never going to be able to get that approval from my father. My father died when I was 10 years old and I've been chasing his ghost for 30 years. In fact, I never even got the chance I wanted. I never even got the chance to tell him I wanted to become a dentist. Now as an adult, I realize how crazy it sounds to try to work to get his approval without him even being around to give me that approval. But it's taken me a long time to figure that out. There's always been an emptiness. There's always been something missing. And over the years, I've tried to fill that emptiness with all sorts of things. Cocaine, hookers, strippers, base jumping, paragliding. Just kidding. I've never been base jumping. Achievements is what I've tried to fill that void with. Achievements has, is what I've used to try to fill the emptiness. But it's never done it. It's never worked. Ever since I was 10, I've tried to do things that I thought my dad would want me to do. Things that I thought my dad would be proud of. Because I thought it would make me feel better. When I was in dental school, I ran for and became class president. Didn't make me feel any better. I got picked by my class to give a speech at dental school graduation. Didn't make me feel any better. I even ran for the Texas Dental Association Board of Directors because one time I found my dad's 25 year member pin in his desk and I won that election. And I had to be on the board of directors for the Texas Dental Association for three years, going to 10 meetings a year. I didn't want to do that. It was terrible. What an insane thought process to pick something of that level of commitment because I thought it would make my dead father proud. Look at this photo. This is the most undiverse group of people in the entire world. Look at me down here in the front left corner like Benjamin Button aging backwards. I mean, in the meeting, in the, the minutes of the meeting, it would have a reminder at 1030 to remind everyone at the meeting to take their Lipitor. I was like, I listened to Kanye on the way over here. What am I doing in this room? I mean, that thought process is absolutely insane. It's like finding a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader calendar in my dad's office and then deciding to try out to become a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader and then making it and having to be a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. Those outfits don't look comfortable. I can't walk around in those boots. I can't do that leg kick. What am I doing? What an insane thought process. None of it ever filled the emptiness. What I didn't realize is that I started to resent dentistry for not filling that emptiness. That could never be filled by anything anyway. I was holding dentistry accountable for that, and it was making me miserable. I started to wear that resentment a lot more outwardly. And I couldn't tell it, but the people around me could. And I mean my team and my patients. We use this software for reactivations in my office. Patient hasn't been into the office in about 18 months. This software will send them an email or a text message trying to get them to come back in to get their next, you know, to get the profi and get caught up on, on what they missed. Um, and it does give them an option to uh, opt out of that. Uh, and then it gives them a choice of why they're opting out. And one of the choices is um, that they are seeking dental care elsewhere. And it will send us an email based on their response. Uh, and so one morning I show up to the office and uh, one of the first things I do is I check the office email uh, and I come across this email. This is a, uh, an automated message from Chris um, that, uh, uh, you know, Chris is seeking dental care elsewhere. Um, and the notes is really what shocked me. He says uh, he switched dentists because, quote, Dr. Austin just seems so angry all the time. You mother, I'm kidding. But I, I was really shocked by this because I thought I was a great actor. I thought I was Daniel Day-Lewis putting on a great show every day for my patients. And I thought they all loved me. And I thought my team loved me. And it turns out they could all tell. Turns out I wasn't such a great actor and patients could sense it. They could sense my unhappiness 
And I can't let that continue to happen. I couldn't let that continue to happen. And then I thought about it. Am I angry all the time? And I looked up from my computer in my office and I see this. A hole in the wall that I punched um, one day. Um, maybe Chris is right. Maybe I do have an anger problem. This is, like I said, one of the walls of my private office. And I can't even remember what set me off enough to punch a hole through the sheetrock. I can't remember it. And that's when I really realized that I needed help. I needed to talk to someone and I needed to talk to a professional. And because of how I'm wired and because of my age and how I pick other businesses, my first thought was to look on Yelp, which is crazy. Makes sense, right? Best cheeseburger, look on Yelp. Best sushi, look on Yelp. Best mental health professional equipped with unique skills to help you improve your relationships and keep you from jumping off the roof of your building? Yelp. So I went to the top two rated therapists on Yelp in San Antonio. Um, and it turns out they were all really highly rated because all they really do is just sit back and listen to you talk and they never challenged me on anything. So I didn't get any better. And I didn't click with those therapists. I looked then on Google and looked at Google reviews and found the best therapist in San Antonio on Google. And I went to them and had the same experience. Nothing had been or was a good fit. And so in desperation, I checked out Tinder. Turns out it's a great place to meet people with mental health issues, just not a great place to get the mental professional help that I needed. I didn't go to Tinder and no, I didn't go to Grindr either. Um, one of the first places I tried for therapy um, was an app. And that app is called Talkspace. Um, and there are several apps that do this uh, same kind of thing. Um, but you get paired with a therapist based on a questionnaire that you fill out and, and answer. Um, it only behooves you to answer the application questions and the, and the screening process truthfully because it helps get you with somebody um, that really is a good fit for you. Uh, and when you use therapy like this, you have a couple of different options. You can talk on the phone with your therapist and, and phone calls that you schedule. Um, you can also do Skype or FaceTime uh, sort of through their app and in a telehealth manner, um, which, you know, probably at the time that this app came out was pretty revolutionary. And now we're finding, um, you know, that that's a, a much more common way to do things now. Um, but a lot of times we just text, which is an interesting way to do therapy. Um, it really fits well into your life and it's good for daily checkups. I don't have to cancel patient time. I don't have to drive uh, to another office and leave my office. Uh, and honestly, sometimes I can be a lot more honest over text than I can in a real life, either virtual or face-to-face -face conversation. Now, let me give you an example of, uh, of how this has uh, improved my life. Uh, I got a message from my therapist one day. Uh, Brittany checking in on me to see how I was doing. How are you feeling today? It's a tough day. It seems like I've been having a lot of issues getting my team on board with what I want them to do. Huh, that's interesting. Is there one team member that seems to be the problem? That's a good question. Let me think about that. You've mentioned your office manager before. Is it her? No, it's not her. Is it your dental assistant who has been calling in sick recently? No, she's been much better. It's actually someone that I've never blamed for anything before. Who is that? I think the problem is me. I'd be lying if I said that wasn't hard to type. That is a great insight. Now we have some great work we can do. You've seen me shown some examples of my anger issues today. The issue with Chris, the hole in my office wall. This isn't an instant cure therapy. It's not an extraction of an abscess tooth where there's immediate, immediate relief. It's a process. It's about progress and not perfection. Day by day, week by week, year by year. My team notices a difference and hopefully my patients notice it too. Um, Am I saying that everyone needs therapy? No, of course not. Um, I just think every dentist needs therapy. I say that jokingly, but it's actually true. 
I think everyone could benefit from an objective third party giving you feedback about your complaints or about your life and your team and your relationships. How many times have you been at a party and you met someone new and you told them that you're a dentist and they bring up what? What's up with the suicide thing? They always say it like that. They always hush their voice a little bit and they put quotations around it, um, which again, to me is code for uh, from the person you're talking to that our job sucks so much that we should literally just kill ourselves. That's what I hear in my head when someone asks me about dentists and suicide. And they probably don't mean that, but that's what I hear. Um, this job isn't easy. Patients don't want to be in our chairs. They don't want to pay anything because their insurance should pay for it all. They don't want to have any problems afterwards either. And they want whatever we do to last them forever for the rest of their life. Doc, you just did that filling 14 years ago. What do you mean it needs a crown now? Doesn't a filling last forever? Lady, you are 44 years old. You spend most of your free time getting Botox in and around your face and fillers injected everywhere humanly possible. You do nothing but drink diet Red Bulls all day at your desk and sneak away to your Toyota Sequoia Toyota Sequoia to suck on your jewel vape at lunchtime, mm, mango flavor. Nothing lasts forever, especially not that Z100 resin that I did during George W. Bush's second term. One day I heard that someone a couple years ahead of me in dental school had died by a suicide. So I just decided to do some research and find out what is the real prevalence about those type of issues in dentistry? And I found this article by Vice, uh, which I actually really enjoy Vice. Um, I enjoy everything that Vice does except for the graphics that they put on this article. First off, no one wears a tie to work in dentistry anymore, especially now during COVID. So can we, can we replace the, the coat and tie with some big scrubs maybe and not enough PPE in this illustration? And also the sort of bloody corpse on the toothbrush bristles, again, a little over exaggerated. So Vice, I like a lot of things you do, but graphic design on this, on this one maybe could have been a little bit better. Um, when you start digging into the data, you do find some interesting stuff though. So this is from the CDC. Um, and, and this basically shows that in this database of national occupational mortality surveillance, which is constantly, uh, being run by the CDC, dentists are 2.5 times more likely to die via suicide than the general population. That's a significant number, especially coming from a source like this. This study, which was from the Journal of Deviant Behavior, which I now really want to get a subscription to, it sounds great. That's got to be better reading than the Journal of Periodontology. Suicide risk among dentists, being a dentist increased one's risk of suicide by 564%. This is from the ADA. Dentists have double the rate of diagnosed depression, anxiety disorder, and panic attacks than the general population. And that's self-reported data. So you know that that number is low. There are many dentists who would not feel comfortable saying yes to the survey. So it's at least double and probably more. Why? Why is this such a problem for dentists? Why do dentists have these increased rates of depression, anxiety, panic attacks, and have such a disproportionate percentage of our field have their lives end in suicide? And so I started looking into some of that. How about this? This is from uh, the British Medical Journal. 90% of dentists report regular musculoskeletal pain. 90% regular. Doesn't necessarily mean every day, but a regular interval. Interval. So that means at least a couple times a week, people in the dental industry are in musculoskeletal pain. Pain equals depression. Living in pain is a terrible way to do it, and many dentists are living in pain. This is from again another study from Jada uh, at the ADA. Thirty-eight percent of dentists are frequently or always worried, and thirty-four percent of dentists are frequently or always physically or emotionally exhausted. Those numbers are staggering. 
more than a third of us never stop worrying and are always exhausted. That's a horrible way to live life, especially a life that we worked so hard to build. And this is what it's like. This is from the CDC. This is risk factors for suicide. So let's go through some of these that may be relevant to dentists. How about this? A history of mental order, mental disorders, particularly clinical depression. Well, we talked about how dentists are twice as likely to suffer from clinical depression than the general population. You see why that one comes in. How about this? A history of alcohol and substance abuse. Something I feel like I hear about a lot of dentists having. Feelings of hopelessness. You remember that 34% of dentists who are always or sometimes physically or emotionally exhausted? That seems like that. Isolation. Many dentists, 60% of dentists in the United States practice in solo practitioner offices. Isolation. And I'm not talking about a rubber dam. Physical illness. You remember the 90% of dentists that are always in pain. And unwillingness to seek help because of the stigma attached to mental health and substance abuse. Think about the last dental meeting you went to. Did you see courses about all on fours and implant placement and sinus lifts and vertical ridge augs and veneers and full mouth rehabilitation? Absolutely. What did you not see a course on? This. Because we don't want to talk about it. We need to talk about it. It is okay to not be okay. And we need to be okay coming to that conclusion and realizing and feeling that. It's okay. This is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This is basically the Bible of mental diagnoses. It reminds me of the American College of Prosthodontics glossary of terms. Our pros department at UT San Antonio Dental School was all over us. We read that glossary of, of dental terms from the American College of Prosthodontics, um, and, and we always had to cite those things. And this is basically the version of that, but for mental disorders. Um, and when you look at that, there are these different types of mental disorders, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, adjustment disorders, Developmental disorders, eating disorders, sleep disorders, and personality disorders. It is an entire profession going through all these. And obviously, outside of the scope of this and the realm of this, we're really just going to briefly cover some mood disorders. So when you talk about mood disorders, you have three different things that we talk about. We talk about elevated mood. We talk about depressed mood. And we talk about bipolar disorder, which is a mix between the two. Now, again, I am not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm just somebody as a dentist who's read some of this stuff because a huge percentage of our dental team members and colleagues have these issues. And we see these issues in our patients all the time. So it would help us in communication with our friends, colleagues, loved ones, team, and patient if we understood these things a little bit. Under elevated mood, there's really just a couple of main diagnoses, mania and hypomania. Mania is a state of abnormally elevated arousal. It's basically the mirror image of depression. So it's basically, instead of being down, it's being way up. And that way up can be euphoric and it can be all the way to irritable. And generally what starts as euphoria generally becomes uh, irritability, adds on more and more as long as the, the, the longer the mania uh, episode goes on. Um, and when people are in mania, they're more likely to have anxiety because their brain won't shut off and they're at such an elevated level and that leads to violence. So mania sounds great maybe. And, and as college students, maybe we took pills to help us kind of get here and go to raves and stuff like that. Uh, but having that for a long period of time can really lead to problems. Hypomania is basically like a mania uh, but just a little bit more subdued. It's not full on mania, but it is a mood elevation where people behave very different from their typical behavior in a regular state. And that long term hypomania leads to a lot of irritability. So that's where that comes in. Moving on to depressed mood, there's one major diagnosis. The most popular diagnosis is major depressive disorder, MDD. We used to really call it clinical depression or unipolar depression. The term for that is now major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder is ca characterized 
by having some of these diagnostic criteria at least every day for at least two weeks. So in order to be diagnosed with MDD, you're talking about having a depressed mood most of the day, every day, diminished interest or pleasure, feeling blah, right? Either weight loss or weight gain. Some people um, cope with a uh, major depressive disorder with a big gain in appetite, eating junk food, carbohydrates, food high in fat, and things like that. Um, and some people lose their appetite altogether. So either one of those can happen. Some people sleep a lot, that's hypersomnia, and some people cannot sleep. So either one of those things, but generally in extremes is what you're looking at. Same thing here with fatigue or irritability, and you'll generally have a cycle between both. Feelings of worthlessness or guilt, long periods of that lead to suicide ideation uh, and suicidal fantasies, um, and a diminished ability to concentrate or think. And then you add that on to recurrent thoughts of death, and that's how you see how people spiral into um, suicide, you know, uh, uh, suicide issues. 8.5% of the entire world's population has major depressive disorder. That's a staggering number, 8.5%. This is from the DSM, and this is, I think, important today. That's why I put this in when going through COVID-19. Responses to significant loss, i.e. bereavement, financial ruin, losses from a natural disaster or a serious medical illness or disability, may include the feelings of intense sadness, rumination about the loss, insomnia, poor appetite, and weight loss, which may resemble a depressive episode, although such symptoms may be understandable or considered appropriate to the loss, the presence of major depressive episode in addition to the normal response to a significant loss should also be considered. So basically this is saying if someone already had major depressive disorder and you throw on COVID-19 and all of the stuff going on in dentistry right now, it's a recipe for disaster. And that's what we're seeing a lot. Sleep is a big part of this. And Across the board in the literature, when you look, you will see a link between depression and obstructive sleep apnea. So I bring this up more as a clinical issue. And sleep apnea is one of the biggest things that's come along as far as something that I learned nothing about in dental, in dental school, but think about every single day as airway issues. Um, and so, you know, basically, um, if you have patients that are depressed and they have airway issues, their depression is much worse because of those airway issues. I'm not telling you that you're going to cure their depression by fixing their airway, but you can definitely improve it and make it more manageable. Other common uh, mood disorders amongst depressed mood diagnoses, you have major depressive episode. That's where you'll have the same categories and the same diagnostic criteria as major depressive disorder, except it lasts for less than two weeks. Postpartum depression would be another diagnosis. Seasonal affect disorder, basically where you have those types of, of issues, but more during the winter than you do during the summer, that would fall into another diagnosis. And uh, persistent depressive disorder, dyspnea. That's kind of a muted version of major, um, of MDD, major uh, uh, depression. Um, it, it's not gonna be the, the low as MDD, um, but you, it, it's still a depression. It's, it's, it's still clinically lower than, than what your mood should be. Then we move into bipolar disorders, which are a mix between the two, right? You have some mania and you have some depression, you have some mood elevation, you have some mood depression, and you end up with a bipolar issue. Um, and of that, there are three bipolar diagnoses that are, are most common and most important. Number one is bipolar one. You're talking about a mania uh, episode along with a major depressive episode mixed together. So that's high, high and low, low, right? You mix those two together, that's bipolar one. Bipolar two would be a little more muted uh, episodes. So not quite as high of highs and not quite as low of lows, but still a cycle between those two. And those, those two things um, become really, really difficult to deal with. And then we have a cyclothymia, um, which is um, sort of an even more muted version of bipolar two, right? No full maniac episodes, no full major depressive episodes, but the cycling between the two. So talk about worst, um, you know, uh, least, less worst and least worst um, as, as we went through those, those bipolar disorders. I think it's important for us to think about triggers. And in Texas, where we have 
open carry of handguns at college campuses. Um, we think about triggers and we think about this. I'm not thinking about triggers that way. I'm thinking more about this, right? This kind of, of triggered. What are the things that trigger you or trigger ourselves to have these issues? Um, trigger is something that causes something to happen or exist, right? And I think it's really important that we take a look at our triggers. This was said by Mariana Plata, who writes for Psychology Today, learning your emotional red flags is a way to boost your emotional intelligence. And she's referring to red flags. I call them triggers. They're basically the same thing. Our emotional triggers do things to us emotionally. They make us uncomfortable. They highlight what we doubt about ourselves, those things we're self-conscious about, the things we don't feel good enough in. And they refresh frustrations. And I want you to think about how you feel when you're frustrated and those feelings and triggers basically elicit that same uh, emotional biochemical response in your brain. And it's a bad feeling. We don't like those feelings, right? Um, so spending some time to identify what our triggers are can really help us make our lives better and become better humans. I'll share with you my triggers. And I think it's worthwhile for you to spend a few minutes and think about what triggers you. We all have a trigger. Maybe it's less, maybe it's more, but identifying what they are is really important. And some of them you may know intuitively off the top of your head and others you may have to think about, but these are mine. Clinical failures really bother me. I wear them home. Um, I have real problems with them. Um, honestly, social media is a big trigger for me. There's a lot of things about social media that are great, um, but there are some things about it that are bad. Um, I don't like disorganization and clutter and I do not like running behind schedule. And those things trigger me to have issues. As far as dealing with failures go, um, these are just some thoughts that I've had as far as how I try to get better with dealing with failures, because there's been times in my life, and some of those times are as recently as January and February of this year, where I had a clinical failure that sent me into a shame spiral, that sent me into a dark mental place. Um, and I've really tried to think about what are ways I can keep myself from doing that. So the number one thing is, to, in my opinion, is to embrace your emotions. You can't block it out. You can't push it down. You have to say, I had this failure. Either I did this poorly or this whatever happened failed and I feel bad about it. And that's OK. It's OK to feel that way. But let's not start doing unhealthy things like drinking, drug use, things like that as a result to try to cope with the failure. Breathing is always appropriate. Breathing gets us through so many things. Um, and if I had one thought for you to take home, it's just to breathe. Spend some time with your breath. And when I have a failure, I try to just go in my office for a minute and spend some moments with my breath. Um, I, a lot of times, have irrational feelings when I have a failure. I had a, a full arch case where the periodontist who was placing some implants texted me and said she wasn't happy with her provisionals. So she's going to another dentist. And my irrational fear was that, oh my God, um, I'm never going to get another article in dental economics. No one's ever going to ask me to speak. Um, you know, I, I, I'm the worst dentist in the world. Um, and, and when I say by acknowledge that is to let yourself have those thoughts and then realize how irrational they are so that the, uh, uh more logical part of your brains can can move on. Um, develop healthy thoughts. And what I mean by that is instead of the irrational thoughts that we just acknowledged and said, okay, that's where my brain went, but that's obviously not what's going to happen. Let's develop what our thought process should be from this. Um, sometimes there is some of our responsibility and sometimes in dentistry there is not. That's why the word you're is capitalized. Sometimes we have clinical failures that have nothing to do with us. They have to do with the patient not electing for other treatment, not doing the things to correct their bite or their at-home care, their oral microbiome, their caries risk, all of those sort of things that are some that are many times beyond our control. We have to learn that we can't blame ourselves for those things. I bring up Spear and Coist because Spear and Coist are, are particularly good about showing cases that they did poorly. Not every dental speaker is like that. Many aren't. Many would never show you a failure. Uh, and I acknowledge and applaud those two at consistently showing cases that didn't turn out the way they wanted them to because they learned something from them and they want us to learn something from them. 
if Frank Spear and John Coyce can have a failure, so can I. It's going to be okay. And then create your plan. My plan after the uh, provisionals uh, case earlier was to spend some time on provisionals. What things can I do better? Should I be using a different material? Is there a way that I could polish them better? Let's look at things to help me conjure them. What, what about uh, the matrix that we're using? Things like that, right? So that's what I mean by create your plan. When we talk about dealing with our triggers, there's a couple of ways that we can do it. Avoidance or limiting exposure works for some things doesn't work for everything. So social media, we can avoid and limit our exposure to, but we can't necessarily avoid running behind always, right? And so um, there are those situations where um, we need to expose ourselves to them, expose ourselves to them so that we learn to cope with them better. Um, and so one thing that I think of is, is there used to be this television show where people would come on and they'd be like, deathly afraid of snakes or whatever. And they'd make them hold a snake and they wouldn't go from being deathly afraid to snakes to holding a snake, it would start by limited exposures over time until the person was more and more comfortable, right? So um, allergy or immunotherapy is the same kind of idea, right? Um, limiting an exposure of an antigen to a very small amount, little by little by little, until our immune system can deal with that better, right? So um, th those are sort of the deals. Realize intentions. What I mean by this is um, one of the things I'm triggered by is, is running behind. Um, like I said, and, and one thing about running behind that I hate is that I feel like I have to be the quarterback of the schedule because hygiene has to wait on me for exams that I have to sacrifice my schedule to keep them on time. And I will get really frustrated and be triggered by my hygienist telling me that she's ready for a hygiene exam. Her intention is not to trigger me. Her intention is to tell me that she's ready for a hygiene exam. It's me that uses that as the trigger, right? And, and part of that after I get triggered is being angry at the hygienist and it's not her, that was not her intention, right? Um, own your pain. Um, if, you know, if you have a past experience that when you see a similar experience happen to someone else or um, something similar, something that reminds you of that past experience that brings up that pain, um, I think the important thing to realize is that we all have those experiences in our life and life shouldn't be without those experiences. If we do have a life without those experiences, um, then what kind of life did we have? Um, and so that's what I mean by owning your pain, that those are all things that are part of what make us human beings and part of what make our life our life. Um, and it's wearing the scar with honor sometimes, right? Um, as I said, breathing exercises, breathing always helps always oxygen always helps um without oxygen we have nothing and 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 i can thank jeff rouse at the spear institute um for my for him educating me on the importance of breathing not just at night but every day and that translates to this stuff uh, i think meditation is is a great thing and i'll tell you a little bit about that as we wrap up here in just a second and psychotherapy i i really honestly think is a really great thing um, that maybe we should all look into. I wrote an article uh, for this website, dentalhacks.com, um, about social media, and it was called Porn for Your Practice. And, and the biggest part of it was, is that many people on social media post these amazing cases. And those amazing cases um, can actually be detrimental to our, to our mental health. Because we look at those, and every time we're flicking through Instagram and we look at those and we see one of those it's either a beautiful full mouth case or sometimes it's even like a beautiful occlusal composite, you know, that was layered with a bunch of different layers and they use a K file to put stain in and stuff like that. And we look at that and we just look at those things and we say, wow, I can't do that. And every time you say that to yourself, you flex a muscle that says that I can't do that muscle. And every time you flex the, I can't do that muscle, it gets bigger. And in the contralateral side that I can do that, I am good enough muscle, doesn't get worked. So it atrophies. And so social media can turn into that for us. It can turn into I'm not good enough. I don't have the skills to do that. I don't have the practice to do that. I don't have the patience to do that. I don't. I'm not. I'm not good enough. And every time we do that, we lose a little piece of ourselves. That's why social media can be a trigger. 
And that's why we need to really practice limits on our social media. One thing that just irritates me more than anything else is dental Instagram. There are so many influencers on dental Instagram who show these amazing cases and that's great, but they never ever show a failure. And if they do show a failure, it sure as hell wasn't theirs. And I had this situation where I had a couple of Emacs crowns uh, that all broke the same way that were all about the same number of years old. And I posted it as a little test. I said, Hey, influencers, dental Instagram people, I challenge each of you to post a failure. Post one of your failures. Let's learn from it and let's get better. And a bunch of people uh, posted comments saying this, oh, this is great. We should all do this, whatever. And guess how many of those people who I tagged and who were in the conversation on this post, guess how many of them posted a failure of their own? Zero. None of them did. They're all terrified of posting a failure. Social media is about posting our own highlight reels. And there's no context to it. And so when we go and look through that without any context, like I said, we flex our I'm not good enough muscle. That's why I highly recommend a social media vacation. Deactivate your accounts so that people, when they go look for you, you're not there. That way you don't miss any messages or anything like that. If it's something really important, they'll call you or they'll get a hold of you another way or email you. So deactivate your accounts on pretty much any social media platform. You can deactivate an account. It doesn't delete it. It's just hidden. It's lying in waiting for when you're ready to reactivate it. Delete the apps from your phone. And I think we all need to take a social media vacation in at least two weeks a year. In fact, I wish that Facebook would require it. I wish that Instagram would require two weeks of deactivation a year just to get your mind straight. And you'll realize how often you pick up your phone to look at it when you don't really want to or need to, it becomes such a habit. We're so addicted to this garbage. Take a break, take two weeks off. It will make your life better, I promise you. Remember that 90% of dentists that report musculoskeletal pain? Yoga really helps with that. And if you look at the result here, this, this study was done on dental, dental, dental students and dental hygiene students. And it, the conclusion is this research supports the practice of biweekly yoga sessions as beneficial in decreasing musculoskeletal pain in dental hygiene students. Yoga is considered a viable complementary health approach to incorporate into a schedule as means of increasing health and longevity of a, of a dental career. So I, yoga is one of those things I never thought I would enjoy yoga, but I do. Um, and part of it is that I found somebody in my city that's great. And this is Sarah. Sarah, um, honestly, I don't want to say save my life, but she probably saved my career. Um, I hurt my, I, I strained my back somewhat significantly at Greater New York Dental Meeting this past year um, and lectured, you know, three or four lectures over a couple days. Um, and when I got off the plane back here in San Antonio, I was in bad shape um, and I didn't know how I was going to continue to practice. And it was just muscle issues and muscle tightness. And Sarah got it worked out. And between her physical therapy and her yoga practice, I honestly think she saved my career. And, and I asked her, I said, listen, I talked to a lot of dentists and you're not in every city. You're only here. So where do I tell people to look to find people like you who are really talented physical therapists and have gone through a very immense amount of postgraduate study and also incorporate wellness things like yoga, flexibility, meditation, things like that. And she recommended everybody look here. So if you're looking for someone like Sarah to help you in your musculoskeletal pain, look up the Institute of Physical Art and find a provider in your area. And that is the practice that Sarah practices. And she's not only saying my career, she's saying my wife's career, who's also a dentist. Um, she's amazing and she owes her education to this place, the Institute of Physical Art. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, a couple of apps that I've used, and I've actually uh, moved on from Talkspace. Talkspace became a little bit difficult. They started offering um, free uh, counseling and free therapy to uh, medical professionals during COVID-19, and so I filed for that to get a, a credit, um, and they told me that, uh, no, they meant real doctors, uh, which was fun. Um, so I've actually moved on to Talkspace, uh, but I do see another therapist uh, online and we um, we do Skype sessions um, uh, a couple times a month. 
Uh, and so, you know, I think this COVID-19 has really helped therapists realize that about 98% of their patients, they can help with, with telehealth. Uh, and so for us as dentists with busy schedules, this makes it great. I don't have to leave the office. It's awesome. Um, meditation's also really important. Um, meditation is really just the act of trying to master your breath, right? And trying to block everything out and master your breath. Um, and there's actually really good literature on, 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 uh, therapy. Um, if you look at the benefits of psychotherapy, I mean, these are physical benefits. These things happen physically in your brain from talking with another human being who's trained. Uh, you get a, a modulation of dysfunctional networks within your cortical limbic system, an increase in activity in the hippocampus, parahippocampus, and dorsal cingulate, and structural changes to the brain. So from you sitting and talking with the therapist for 50 minutes a week or every other week, you get structural changes in your brain according to the literature. And thanks to functional MRIs, scientists are able to measure this. So it isn't just foo-foo or new age mumbo jumbo. There's actually physical benefits to this stuff. Meditation, super important as well. So this study basically showed that um, meditation for people who have uh, stress, anxiety, and depression, um, in particular mindfulness programs, reduce negative dimensions of psychological stress. So that's important. Spending 10 minutes a day meditating is a very important thing. And it doesn't have to be transcendental meditation, which is what most of us kind of think about when we think of meditation. We think of someone sitting quietly, you know, in a lotus pose for an hour uh, or more a day as they have their mantra running through their head. And that's not really what meditation is, especially mindfulness meditation. Um, you can do a nice meditation in 10 minutes. Uh, and the call map really helps me with that. Um, I really have to have a guided meditation. So I need a voice helping, uh, talking me through and calm does that. Um, the Peloton app, if you're a Peloton member does that, there's lots of great places to get guided meditations. Do that, do that once a day. Um, one of my triggers that I didn't list is the morning huddle. We do a morning huddle every morning. Um, and sometimes they frustrate me. Um, and they frustrate me because everyone's tired, it's early in the morning, and we get into the huddle, um, and people just start reading the schedule. Mrs. Jones is here for a profi. Mrs. Johnson is here for perio maintenance. And I get really frustrated because I can read the own, I can read the schedule my own damn self. I don't need a hygienist or a dental assistant reading me the schedule, right? It's not the point of the schedule. The point of the schedule is to talk about opportunities that we have, to talk about how the day is going to flow find places where, oh, this person asked about bleaching that, that time. This person's a great candidate for Invisalign. Let's make sure we mention that again. Let's make sure we get them booked for that quadrant of crowns in the upper left that they need, right? That's what the, that's what the morning huddle's for. Um, and we end up defaulting into reading the schedule. And I think a lot of you can probably identify with that. And it reminds me of going to church as a kid. Um, and uh, we went to a Methodist church, um, which uh, being a Methodist is the most boring vanilla <laughs> Uh, it's the most uh, boring vanilla denomination of, of Christianity. Um, you know, the, 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 even the Baptists have fun with their, their singing sometimes. Uh, Methodists don't have fun with anything. So uh, when we would sing from the hymnal, it would just be like this. Praise God. Mama. And that's what we do in the morning huddle. Mrs. Jones is here for a profi. Amen. And it would just drive me nuts. And so I'd start the day already annoyed and already having issues. So what I do now is we do the morning huddle. I come into the, I come back into my private office. I close the door for 10 minutes and I do a guided meditation. It helps get me back down to zero. So um, do those meditations when you are feeling the trigger, when you're having the stress, when things are mounting up. Calm, breathe, you'll get better, I promise. Um, <laughs> this, the, the only other time I've done this program, um, I, I kind of use this graphic a lot and, and I, I titled it chamfered psyche. Um, and I just thought it sounded cool. And I actually like went and looked at Netflix comedy specials. Um, and most of them were kind of like in this style. So I made this and, and I, you know, it just makes me think about a, a, what we do in dentistry and, and we spend so much time focused on minutia, 
We refine our margins with red stripe diamonds until they're perfect. We polish our anterior composites till we can see our double chins reflected back at us. If we could just spend a fraction of that time that we spend on refining our margins or polishing our composites on our happiness and our mental health, we'll be happier. Our team will be happier. Our patients will be happier. And our loved ones will be happier. I think that laughter and humor are some of the best ways to deal with stress, anxiety, depression. At the end of our lives, our spirit, our essence, the essence of our lives, in my mind, boils down to the number of times that we laughed. That's what makes a life. Laughter is the best medicine. Laughter is the cure. Laughter is literally the greatest element in the universe. Um, my podcast uh, that I do with a gentleman named Lance Timmerman is called The Working Interferences. It's a dental comedy show because we strictly believe that laughter helps get us through. And dentistry is hard. Dentistry is really hard. Um, we're right back to where we started with my dad. And, you know, it's now my goal to not only put in the work to become a good restorative dentist. Um, but I also want to put in the work to be a well-centered person, be a well-centered human being um, so that my patients and my team can see how grateful I am to have them in my life. I don't want to become one of those awful statistics that's preventable. That I think my friends is something that my dad would be proud of. Thank you guys so much. Be well. All right, doctor, let me come back in here. What an amazing presentation, man. You had me almost in tears at some point. Thank you. Let me tell you a story. Um, well, first of all, I'm speechless almost, uh, but you have hit a major chord with many of us. Thank you for such a heartfelt presentation. Your father, I'm sure, is very proud of you uh, just for uh, becoming a professional, helping other human beings. but. No one has ever been <clears throat> so blunt on this show and exposed this quiet monster that may be in our shadows. We all think about it, but we don't talk about it. My best friend <clears throat> that I met in my senior year of high school and went all through undergrad with and then dental school, um, it was a year behind me. Uh, uh, he went to oral surgery school one year uh, and then decided to go into private practice. And he died uh, with two kids left behind. and completely normal like you and I he never said anything never came out with it I, I wish I could have done something for him I, uh, I I remember this comes up very frequently for me and uh, <clears throat> he left behind a beautiful family but uh, it happened in one night uh, and this is serious stuff and you're right uh, we must be open we must a lot of us must seek ter therapy if not all of us yeah and I am very interested in what some of the things you brought up that I want to want to talk to you about here. Uh, you know, our lives are stressful. We have families, we have dentistry, we have patients, we have finances, offices, now COVID and all of that. And it could easily push someone in the edge. You know that during these times, during these COVID times, a couple of dentists have committed suicide, right? Yeah, there's a pediatric dentist, I think, from South Dakota um, who... Um, like a week and a half ago committed suicide and she took some meds and walked out into the middle of the lake and, and just let herself drown, which to, I, I can't think of a more horrible way to go. And, uh, you know, when all of the people who were friends of hers talked about it, they said, we had no idea that she was even depressed. Um, and that's, you know, we, we developed these coping mechanisms, um, to keep people from knowing that. And, and a lot of times, you know, when, when you find out someone's committed suicide, you, that's you it's exactly like you said we didn't know that there was anything wrong you know um and it, it it's it's just a, it's a huge problem so some are implosive some are explosive and it just builds up and builds up and builds up inside and then and we have you know we're truth or not uh, uh we are known to have a very high if not the highest suicide rate of any profession as you know right. so this was very very uh very exciting let's get to the let's get to the nitty-gritty you took a social media vacation. How did that help you? What happened in those in that time that you were gone? It just quiets the noise, to be honest with you. Um, like I said, it just if you, 
for I challenge everybody just for one day, delete all the social media apps from your phone and realize how often you pick up your phone for no other reason than to look at social media. Not because you're looking for information, but because that's become our social crutch, right? Um, and, and we get that little dose of dopamine every time we do it, so we become addicted to that. Um, and when you realize the first few days when you take a social media vacation, you're gonna realize how often you pick up your phone for no reason, just to look at it, right? And, and not because you're looking for anything, but just because you're so programmed to do that. Um, and so that that's, you know, the quieting the noise in the head and, and all the distractions by stuff that are quite frankly, like many times worthless. Like if you go into some of these big dental groups and you see the infighting that happens, and especially right now, like with the, the, the fighting between the different team members who don't want to come back and, you know, dentists who are trying to, you know, to get their office back up and going and the government and all it, it's, it's, they're, they're kind of wastelands and, and, and they suck the energy out of you. When you get out of it for a couple of weeks, you, you, you start seeing that you don't need it. So when I went, I, I took um, about seven months off of Facebook from August until February of this year, um, August of last year to February of this year. Um, and, and one of my resolutions when I came back was the app will not be on my phone. And so that's been great for me. It's like, hey, if I'm at my computer in my office, I can pull up and see whatever, but I don't get that deeply involved in anything. Um, which is which is is good for me. So um, I would challenge you if you don't want to take a full on vacation, just delete the apps from your phone and just have it. Very you hard for it. some people, Josh. Their whole lives is is on this on this app. They it wake is. up. The first thing they do is they grab their phone. That's uh, it's uh, so horrible. To them, that's an addiction. This is the first thing they do. They it pick is. up the phone, their messages, and that's the last thing they do when they go to bed. So okay. it's a big full blown addiction, right? So when you have your whole life on social media, it's not easy to just get away from it, uh, but it's necessary. When you and I were kids, uh, uh, we didn't have any of this stuff. You were in a no, sandbox, right? Absolutely, you right. You were, I mean, I was outside playing from during the summer, playing baseball or basketball from sun up to sundown every day. My, my mother would have to come find me sometimes to like get me in for dinner, you know? Um, and, and now I, I, I just don't see that. And, and there's something, you know, there's some things that's great about it. You know, there's people that we yeah. meet in our lives that, that's awesome. But there's some things that that aren't great about it, and, and so I think it's just like anything. Moderation is the key, um, and I think deleting the apps from your phone helps you realize how much we use it. That way, we can modulate how often you know and, and how much exposure we have. We shouldn't lead our lives on it. Doesn't mean they can't be part of our lives, but um, we shouldn't lead our lives on social. It's extremely addictive. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Extremely mm -hmm. dopamine article. I read that one too. I'm glad you mentioned it. But every time you see a like or a post or something, dopamine. there's something that happens in your right. brain. And there's times <laughs> I posted stuff and I hit refresh, like, and I'm disappointed. Like, oh, I didn't get, I didn't get 20 likes in 10 minutes. Like, oh, this sucks. You know, and you, then you feel bad about yourself. It's like, what, what am I doing? This is insane. This is insane. It reminds me. My mother smoked for many years. And my mother had to have a cigarette very first thing when she woke up in the morning. She had to have a cigarette before she went to bed. So exactly what you said, when someone picks up their phone first thing in the morning and it's the last thing they do before they go to bed, it reminds me of my mother and her cigarettes. Yeah, fully addicted. And they know this. Uh, the creators of these programs, they yes. feed off of that. A, Absolutely. They're making billions of dollars. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So last but not least, you have uh, as another feed of many that of the initiatives that you have done, and I must commend you for all the research you have done to bring us this presentation today. It will be etched in history, and people will review it over and over again. And it might help them to speak with a, one of their colleagues that are dear to them, or reach out to an app or somebody uh, that that might be able to help them. It's not a disease; it's a medical condition, substance abuse, mental disorders, uh, mood swings. Uh, all of those things are medical conditions. Nothing to be ashamed of. Um, and and uh, and maybe this will help save some uh, some lives from our uh, dear colleagues out there. But last but not least, you created humor. I 100% agree with you. Humor, humor and exercise is the medicine to all, right? You know, exercising, l letting your frustrations out, having some humor, laughing things off. Um, you created also a Facebook page. Uh, I uh, uh, for for people to vent off. I'm not gonna let you guys know. Just look it up. Uh, uh, Austin is an administrator there. You'll get a good laugh every day around the clock uh, of things that we encounter in a dental setting or outside of a dental setting. 
and join that Facebook group. I joined a few months ago, and I'm a I'm a regular there. So <laughs> it's kind of a mess. So now I understand why you set that up. Now that you explained, yeah, it's it's honestly like bonding with some something bonding with somebody over something funny. Uh, it, you know, think about the power of an inside joke, right? The power of of two people sharing some humor between them. Uh, is is more moving than anything else, and and I think that helps build relationships more than anything. So, um, you know, it's it's part of my new patient exam. If I can make a new patient laugh, I'm pretty sure they're coming back. You know, uh, during their, their their my first meeting with them. So, you know, humor is really at the source of everything, in in my opinion. It's it's what it's what gets me through the day. And that's part of the way of also establishing rapport with patients. Patients are normal people like you and me. They don't care about six degree tapers and what have you. They want to know that you're a good guy. That you can bond with them, uh, and uh, I try to make them laugh as much as I can in the office as well. With that said, Doctor Austin, uh, um, we are very grateful for what you do for the profession and your presentation and your contribution to this peer-to-peer -peer project. I wish you a wonderful day. I know you're in the office, um, and uh, uh, take care of yourself. And look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. Peace. Thanks, everybody. Hey, take care.